We thought we would be outdoors this morning, enjoying our final garden service of the year. But as someone is always saying when they get up here, you can't mess up church. So here we are indoors and grateful for the shelter. We are able to pivot if you are accustomed to having a bulletin letting you know what's coming next so that you can check it off. Um, you'll just need to live in the moment of surprise <laughs> and just roll with us. And again, you can't mess up church. We have shown up. The Spirit is here to meet us, and it is a blessing. So we welcome you, whether you come here regularly to this community, whether you're visiting for the first time, perhaps you've been away after an absence, However it is that you have arrived here today, we are delighted to be here in this place, in your presence, and in the presence of our God. We are better for each one of us being here. Let us begin with a prayer offered by Walter Brueggemann. We confess you to be the God who calls, who wills, who summons, who has concrete intentions for your creation and addresses human agents who do your will. We imagine ourselves called by you, yet a strange lot, called but cowardly, obedient but self-indulgent, devoted to you but otherwise preoccupied. In our strange mix and answering and refusing, we give thanks for your call. We pray this day for ourselves, fresh vision, for our friends, great courage, for those in places more dangerous than our own, deep freedom. As we seek to answer your call, may we be haunted by your large purposes. We pray in the name of the utterly called Jesus. Amen. Give us, O oh Lord, steadfast hearts which no unworthy thought can drag downwards, unconquered hearts, which no tribulation can wear out, upright hearts, which no unworthy purpose may tempt aside. Bestow upon us also, O Lord God, understanding to know you, diligence to seek you, wisdom to find you, and a faithfulness that may finally embrace you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please remain standing and join in our opening hymn. You'll find it on page 363, God of the Ages, 363. Let my people go. 
grateful for this time together and we pray that these words that are spoken now would be the ones that your people need to hear. May we leave, to hear, leave this place differently than we entered in. Amen. Right now, as we speak, people are witnessing another kind of ancient wilderness wandering. This morning is a big day for asteroid research. All right, we have some, some stargazers out there because this morning in Utah, uh, uh, and, uh, NASA has been engaged in a seven year long mission to get a bit of debris from an asteroid that is on an orbit kind of similar to Earth's own. So uh, five years ago, they sent this, this vessel out and it scraped a little bit of an asteroid of Bennu, which is this asteroid that, that takes about a year and a half to get around the sun. And about every six years, we're kind of in, in sync with it for a moment. So uh, the space vessel went and scratched a little bit of this stardust that the, the scientists believe was present from the very, very earliest origins of our universe. And it took it another couple of years to come back. And at 10 a.m., were I not in your midst, I would have been watching it crash down into the deserts of Utah. And we're going to begin to discover even more about some of our origins and how magnificent this universe is that we indwell. Stay tuned for more on this kind of stargazing and ancient wilderness exploration. This morning, we look to the cusp of the origins of another ancient wilderness wandering. Moses is on the verge of leading the Hebrew people out of captivity. What happens to people when they are pressed to extreme choices? We have for some time now been following the story of Moses from his infancy up to this moment where he is still seeking the liberation of his people. And we see Moses and his people have been pushed into this extreme and narrow place. And we see Pharaoh also being pushed to make extreme choices. And we can see how folks respond when they are under pressure. This past week was the birthday of writer William Golding, and he served in World War II in the Royal British Navy in 1940, and, and he got deeply troubled by what he saw in the war. <coughs> Once he faced a gut-wrenching quandary when he learned that a ship under his command would have to cross a minefield in order to arrive in time for D-Day operations, and he couldn't decide whether he should risk the lives of his own crew in this minefield or the lives of all of those who are participating in D-Day who needed their help. In the end, he decided to risk the journey and only later learned that the minefield was fictional. It was put on the map to fool the Germans. So his moral dilemma had no basis in reality, but he found this experience and many others like it profoundly disorienting. He said he began to see what people were capable of doing and that anyone who moved through those years without understanding that humanity is capable of producing evil as a bee produces honey must have been wrong in the head. Informed by his wartime experiences and then also his later work as a school teacher, he wrote a novel that became a classic of 20th century English literature exploring the shadow side of human nature, translating the Hebrew name Belzebub into its literal English equivalent, he titled his novel, Lord of the Flies. It, it seemed fitting since we were discussing plagues this week. If we were outside, you might be swatting a few of them away. Today begins Yom Kippur, at sunset, and it concludes throughout this holy week, these days of atonement in Judaism, 
which for many Jews are the holiest time of the year. It's traditionally marked with fasting, intensive prayer, and, and services. And, and then on the 30th, next weekend, it, they'll begin Sukkot, where Jews will build booths or tents to live in outside to commemorate this wilderness wandering in the desert for 40 years. It's a temporary structure to remind them of what their ancestors went through in these wanderings. What do we do, friends, when we get pushed to a breaking point? Do we choose to harden our hearts? Do we become more tender? How do we remember and how do we move on from these places? We remember that God called Moses on Mount Sinai and directed him to serve as God's own prophet and spokesperson. And Moses was pretty reluctant. He knew this wasn't going to be an easy job, and he gave every excuse he could think of. The Pharaoh didn't know this God and had no incentive to meet this God's demands. And so Moses is equipped with a number of disincentives, as it were, to try to motivate the Pharaoh to do the right thing. And so this God is introduced to Pharaoh by means of plagues. The Nile River turns to blood, and then there's frogs and insects and blight, blisters all over the skin, hail and thunder, locusts, darkness, and ultimately the death of the firstborn. A pattern emerges here. Pharaoh refuses the demand to let the people go, and this refusal elicits a show of power in the form of a plague. And then the Pharaoh capitulates momentarily only to refuse again later. The text says that the Pharaoh's heart hardened, setting up this cycle of refusals and plagues again and again until the final plague, the death of the firstborn and every household not protected by a sign. Many have read this passage and wondered, like, why ten plagues? And, and, and what's the deal with Pharaoh's heart? What's going on with Pharaoh's heart? Because it says for the first five plagues that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And then we see later in the passage, God hardens Pharaoh's heart, which, which is a hard thing to put our heads around. The scholar Judy Ventress Williams says one possibility in this story is that there were ten plagues because it, it employs a formula that we see elsewhere in wisdom literature and in poetry where there's perhaps a number of examples in a category and then just one, several examples, call them X, and then one that's Y. For example, Proverbs 30 says there are three excellent things in their stride, four that are excellent as they walk. And the emphasis is always on the last one in the sequence. And, and this may be the kind of model that's at play in this text here. God's ongoing display of power takes place in response to the stubbornness of Pharaoh's heart. And in these passages, sometimes the Pharaoh is in control of his own heart, and at other times, it doesn't seem to be the case. And it makes us ask, does the ruler of Egypt have free will? in this instance. And if he doesn't, what does that imply about how God is functioning in the world and in Egypt in particular at this time? Does this mean that the Pharaoh was manipulated maybe even until this tenth plague becomes inevitable? And what does that say about God? And that seems rather inconsistent with many of the other things that we believe about our Creator. Kendall Hobbes cites the story of Pharaoh in a list of alleged atrocities that he says were committed by God in the article, Why I'm No Longer a Christian. He says that the Exodus story, when the Egyptian Pharaoh was repeatedly ready and willing to let Moses and his people go until God hardened his heart, and then God punished him for his hardened heart by sending plagues or killing children throughout all of Egypt. Well, that doesn't sound right. One wonders why God took so much time 
with all of this drawn out process when, when God could have just made it happen in moments, as happened at the Red Sea? Why this seemingly unnecessary dramatics in the exodus from Egypt? I, I mean, it's more like a kitty with a wounded animal than a sovereign deity. Scholars have turned this over for thousands of years. And it seems that God is trying to give Pharaoh a chance to do the right thing. But instead, the Pharaoh increases the slave's burden. God offers Pharaoh's ten chances to free them and redeem himself in the process, but each time the Pharaoh refuses. And with each refusal, Pharaoh unwittingly brings Egypt closer to the brink. So why, why would God harden Pharaoh's heart? We can understand why Pharaoh would harden his own heart. It seems that the, 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 the king was warned each time. This was no surprise exodus. He can't say he didn't see it coming. And each time they provide an opportunity for an alternate course of action. But each time he doubles down on the treatment of the Israelites, even to the point of regretting freeing them, even after the death of the firstborns, chasing them into the sea. It says... In chapter 8 of Exodus, when Pharaoh saw that there was respite for the workers, just like the wicked, the rabbinic commentaries say, when they're in trouble, they affect humility, but as soon as, as they have respite, they'll return to their perversity. So the Pharaoh says, when he's hurting, oh, yes, of course, we should stop this. But as soon as everything's fine again, he's like, eh, I didn't really mean it. You're going to have a little more work to do, because you wouldn't be thinking of liberation if you had... So much, you clearly have too much free time on your hands. Walter Brueggemann talks about this passage saying that, that when Pharaoh, after the ninth plague, starts to negotiate with Moses and urges him to leave at least Israel's flocks and herds behind. And here, Brueggemann focuses on Moses' response to Pharaoh, where Moses says, Our livestock also must go with us, not a hoof shall be left behind. According to Brueggemann, not a hoof denotes that God's liberating work includes not just every man and woman and child in the community, but even every part of every animal. Thus, Moses' defiant response represents God's will for the freedom of an entire community, showing solidarity and suggesting a profound belonging that treasures every member of the community and every part of every member of the community. It's not really freedom until we all get to go. So when the text says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, it could mean that God would permit or allow Pharaoh's heart to be hardened. Because Pharaoh was not sitting around all day long thinking of ways to improve the lives of the Hebrews. He was oppressing them terribly. They were forced to perform hard labor and were mistreated, enslaved, beaten. We know that they had become so numerous that the Egyptian pharaoh perceived them as a potential threat for years and had success, unsuccessfully attempted to diminish this perceived threat by enslaving them, demanding that the Hebrew midwives kill all the male babies when they were born, and then finally commanding all of his people to kill Hebrew baby boys by throwing them into the Nile. And the, the pharaoh that Moses interacts with in this passage is no different. Remember back in chapter 5 when they just wanted three days to go have some time to pray in the wilderness? What does the Pharaoh call them? He says they're lazy. He increased their workload by requiring them then to collect the straw they used to make their bricks, which had formerly been provided to them by their overseers, without lowering their daily quota in an attempt to overwork them to the point that they would be too exhausted to even listen to what Moses or Aaron had to say. Rabbi Silverberg has said, how could the Pharaoh be punished for refusing to comply with God's demands to grant freedom to the Israelites if God's own self hardened his heart? Abraham said, will the judge of the entire earth not perform justice? In the 13th century, a Spanish rabbi uh, gave a kind of curious response to this to this pickle, saying that when God initially instructed Moses, Yahweh forewarns that 
in order to increase my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, this will be a process that takes some time. But it, in this country in particular, we really want to believe that we have free will and that how we live here is our choice and that we wouldn't be punished for things that we didn't have choice over. We even one of our children said she might be tempted to have a harder heart if she was subjected to some group punishment when she had done the right thing. Right? I think we all feel that sense of injustice. So Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman said that, 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 curiously, now stick with me here, he says that the hardening of Pharaoh's heart actually granted him free will. Because had he not had his heart hardened, his actions wouldn't have been a true reflection of his will. That he would have been influenced by all these events, the plagues, these, these difficulties, and, and would have wanted to have done something else, but wouldn't have been able to because it was just so terrible. I mean, our children said after that first plague, they said, let him go, let him go. And so this logic, it, I'm, I'm going to say it's a little convoluted, but it suggests that, that by hardening Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh was able to act really according to his true will and not be swayed by all these terrible things happening on the ground. Do with that what you will. But God didn't need to harden Pharaoh's heart for the first place because his heart was already hard on its own. There's another uh, commentary that suggests that the plagues were actually a, a kind of a blessing for the Egyptians because they had been having uh, border disputes with Ethiopia for so long and they could not agree on where the actual border was between Ethiopia and Egypt. And once the plagues rained down, they're like, well, hmm, this is clearly Egypt and that's clearly Ethiopia. I mean, that's one way to draw your map. <laughs> So if this idea of the Pharaoh's heart being hardened so he could actually do what it is that he wanted to do, what do we think about that? I mean, how would you act if the consequences of your choices didn't affect you? Because the ability to repent and to change our actions and to choose a different path is a gift from God. This is what our Jewish brothers and sisters are doing right now in these days of atonement. Free choice is the basis of repentance, and it is also a great gift. It may be that the process of the plagues and the exodus weren't the result of a free choice. Maybe the family really wasn't being offered a choice to let them go, and then was judged on that choice. Because after hundreds of years of horrific cruelty towards God's people, Moses wasn't presenting a choice to Pharaoh, but rather placing before him the divine sentencing that came as a result of all his previous actions. It says in this passage that Pharaoh's heart hardened, and it shows up some 20 times in the book of Exodus. Each of the ten plagues is connected to a specific incident of the Pharaoh's heart being hardened. In the last five, God hardens Pharaoh's heart. If we continually make poor choices, do doors not eventually close? Do we cease to even see possibilities that may be in front of us? Perhaps this is the nature of the hardness of his heart. I mean, from a psychological perspective, each of us is endowed with free will, but over time we build up patterns of behavior that largely dictate the decisions that we make. As Charles Duhigg points out in The Power of Habit, the ability to confront the thousands of minute decisions that we face daily, we, we rely upon patterns of behavior to navigate from one moment to the next. And if we decide to oppress and harm those around us, after a period of time, we will automatically do so without even giving our actions a second thought. Therefore, the heart we once hardened ourselves will become hardened on its own to the point of calcification. Brueggemann suggests that Pharaoh's hardness of heart has to do with his own sense of absoluteness in the face of what was happening all around him as his own power starts to erode. 
We even hear this passage in the New Testament in reference to some of the disciples. In Mark 6, the disciples couldn't understand after seeing this ample meal that Jesus provides to feed the thousands who are camped out listening to his sermons on the mount and on the plain, after watching him walk across the waters of Galilee because it says of their hardness of heart, their minds were closed. They could not perceive what was right in front of them. Nachmanides goes on to suggest that when the Pharaoh's heart was hardened, he became so fearful of God that his resolve weakened to let them go. And he suggests that that motivation isn't the one that God was seeking, that we shouldn't do something out of fear. We don't pray to be united with God so that we can get a get-out-of-hell-free card. We, we run towards God out of love, not out of fear of some punishment. And, and the, the rabbi suggested that the Pharaoh's heart would, would be moved due to fear, not due to the sense of repentance or turning in a sincere way. I, I would suspect that those people who were enslaved wouldn't have cared what Pharaoh's motivation was. The concern was that the Pharaoh would act in some ways like a schoolyard bully, who would delay the bullying just because the teacher was watching, but later would return to the same violence. And so God hardened Pharaoh's heart to restore his ability to act independent of consequence and to show his true character before both the Israelites and the Egyptian nation. Because we know a temporary peace only gives the oppressor the opportunity to reload and consider new strategies. When wet concrete is poured into a mold to form a sidewalk, it remains concrete both in before, before and after it hardens. It doesn't become something else. There's different ways for us to think about how God interacts with history. One is of God up in heaven who periodically dispatches a lightning bolt of intervention. The calling of Moses from the burning bush, the ten plagues, the prophets, the birth of Jesus. And indeed our scripture portrays such divine interventions, although they usually follow years and years of waiting and doubt. And another model shows a God beneath history, continuously sustaining it, and occasionally breaking the surface with a visible act that emerges into plain sight, like the tip of an iceberg. Any of us can see these dramatic breakthroughs. Egypt's Pharaoh certainly had no trouble noticing the ten plagues, but a life of faith involves a search below the surface as well and a fine-tuned ear to the tremors and rumors of transcendence rumbling beneath us. We know that the Exodus story isn't just an ancient one, but it's a living narrative that's relevant to our contemporary life and concerns. It's up to us to keep our own hearts supple, to tenderize our own hearts, so that you and others might be fully free. The Pharaoh, with all his riches, was changed to the people that he enslaved, like slaveholders in the antebellum south living in fear of an uprising. Each are bound to the other. Because liberation is not selective. The benefits are never for just one group. Feminism was a gift for men and for women. Recognizing same-sex unions was a gift for straight couples. It offered more ways for us to be in marriage and in partnership. I mean, think about it. 20 years ago, if I talked about my partner, you'd have said, what business are you in? And now you presume I'm talking about the person who I share the most intimacy with. There are different ways that we might foster change in the world we live in. And one is the way of compulsion of experience, the whip and the spur of historical inevitability, the coercion of facts. And that is a hard and better way. The other is the way of foresight, of preparation, of imagination. And it's also the way of moral compulsion. And it may be no less hard, but it is not better. God has called us to tender our hearts. As Parker Palmer says, that 
if we are if we are are brittle when our hearts break because our hearts will break world friends they will break but he says they can break in different ways they can shatter into thousands of pieces with brittle shards that do more harm when our hearts are broken or our hearts can break into a greater and greater capacity to hold more and to love more so this is part of how we keep our hearts tender is sometimes as the hymn says we have to let our hearts be broken because this is how we preclude this hardness and fossilization of our own hearts God has reminded us, I have put before you life and death, blessing and curse. The answer is up to us. Keep your heart tender and flexible. This is how we free the world. Amen. Amen.